Uh, we call it the order of the Clayton Fire District Board of Directors meeting for December 18, 2023. Our meeting location is at Station 5. We're also available remote. At Clayton Fire District, we are always here for you. We value our people and the people we serve. Our focus is establishing teams, trust, empowerment, accountability, mindset, and service. If you are attending in person, please sign in on the sheet next to the door. Uh, it's meeting is being called to order uh, per ORS 192610 to 192.690. And we are coming to order at 5 o'clock. Uh, per ORS 192.650, this meeting is being recorded. Video recording of this meeting will be placed on the Clackamas Fire District website. Uh, please stand and face the flag for the plate of please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and justice. Okay. First up, Chief Stewart, are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, there is one change. I'd like to uh, go ahead and cancel R1F, which is the union update. Andrew Gordian is unable to attend this meeting. So we can't make that. And then we have the audit presentation. Is that, are they going to be by Zoom? Yes. Okay. Uh, with that, I think we're, that's our Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up is approval of minutes of the regular board meeting on November 20th, 2023. Any board members have any comments or changes to share? Yeah. Thomas, did you have anything? I cannot really hear anything. Can you hear us now? Very faintly. So I'm, I'm trying to see if I can increase my volume. That's okay. That's okay. No, I don't have any questions. Okay. Uh, if there are no changes, the minutes for the regular board meeting on November 20, 2023, stand approved as written. Uh, public comment. We have uh, one here and one to read. Yes. Um, uh, we have someone signed up. Uh, let's see. Julie Kennedy? Maybe not here. Maybe not here. How about I'll just read them both in and we'll call them. Uh, oh, verbally turn me in person. Okay. Uh, at the November board meeting, it was mentioned about the great health and wellness program. If the board is willing, I'd like to give a little boots on the ground from a firefighter family perspective, some of the things that will affect the side of mental health, aka attitude, etc. So I guess I can't really do that. So the next one that she requested to be read into the meeting minutes from Tiffany Shireman. Greetings and thank you for making written public comment an option for the community. Our family lives in Redland, and a family member recently experienced an accidental fall at home that required immediate care. I am writing to share that the fire department professionals that came to our home arrived quickly, assessed the situation thoroughly, provided care that maintained our family's member's dignity, and communicated openly with us about what was happening and what would be happening next. The team that arrived at our home provided immediate medical care and kept everyone calm. I am appreciative of our local first responders. Thank you, Tiffany Shireman, Redland. That's nice. Okay. Uh, that gets us through public comment. Uh, we didn't have anyone sign up. If anyone does want to speak, if you want to sign up or let us know, uh, each one of three minutes and they were there. I'm used to just winging this. I'm not good. I write my own material. <laughs> uh, next, we have the presentation of the annual audit. Uh, it's Kathy Wilson, singer Luak. Uh, is Kathy online for us? Jesus. Mark, are you going to give us a bit of an introduction? Uh, I can while, while Kathy comes online. So um, we completed the audit um, back in November um, with uh, the help of, of Sam Blue. And I'll, I'll let Kathy speak to the, the contents of, of what they found, but I'm, I'm pleased that we had it done uh, on time this year and didn't need an extension. So that's an improvement over my first two years. I just appreciate the work that the staff, including um, Michael and the rest of the finance team, put in on the on the grand financials. So, 
Not over the cap. They're doing that to try to get a better performance review, just improvement every year. <laughs> <laughs> Am I good to go? Wonderful. Thank you for having me here this evening to present your financial statements for Clackamas County Fire District number one for the year ending June 30th, 2023. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that Mark and Michael and staff are really good to work with. They provided all the information that we needed in order to be able to get the audit completed. Um, we had no issues this year with any of the balances. There were no adjustments that were recorded. So that made our job a whole lot easier. Um, we were able to get in, get the audit done, get out, get your financial statements put together into management to review and approve those. Um, you should all have um, the independent auditor's report um, included in your financial statements. Um, and that talks about uh, our opinions. It talks about management's responsibility related to the financial statements and also talks about our responsibility related to the financial statements. Um, our job is to audit um, in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards um, and which we did. Um, and you present financial statements that are on gap basis, so full accrual. Um, and uh, our opinion is that those financial statements are presented fairly in all material respects in accordance with gap. Um, and that's for your governmental activities, your major fund, the general fund, and all the aggregate remaining fund information that's presented in the financial statements. And so it's a, that's a really easy one to uh, present this year because we really didn't have uh, much of anything uh, to talk about there. Um, also in the financial statements, the very back of the financial statements is our report to the Secretary of State's office um, regarding um, compliance with Oregon State regulations. And I'm happy to say that we found nothing um, that came to our attention to believe that the district was not in substantial compliance with those requirements. So I was not going to go over numbers in the financial statements. So I figured if there were questions related to that, that Mark would be the best person to answer those. Um, does anybody have anything they want to comment on related to the financial statements? Anyone have any questions? I have a question about the letter, not the financial documents themselves. Um, you've identified a uh, deficiency in internal controls regarding the timesheet, um, but stated that it does not constitute a significant deficiency or a material weakness. Why is it brought to our attention then if it's significant or material? Because we felt that it was still something that was significant enough to bring to your attention. It did not, um, it does not, in our opinion. Um, constitute a significant deficiency or material weakness, but it is um, a deficiency in internal control um, that we feel is important enough to bring to your attention. And it, it is a um, continuation of one that we noted last year. Um, management is working on that. Um, and I was going to discuss the letters that were also um, included here next, um, but thank you. <laughs> thank you for being proactive. Um, and uh, Mark has uh, indicated that you guys are still working with the software vendor to try to be able to provide a report that shows us who approves the timesheets. Um, you know, the control is um, that if there's a situation where someone could approve their own timesheet or somebody who was not an appropriate person to approve the timesheet could do that, right? And then they could, uh, you could have collusion, you could have fraud perpetrated. And so um, that's why we feel it's important to be able to test that control. Well, I agree, and uh, I am bothered that this was in your letter last year, and it's still in the letter this year. If right. it's still here next year, is there, do we get some sort of penalty, or? No, nope. no, um, we don't, there is an approval process that is happening. We're just unable to verify who it is that's providing the approval, right? So you can look in the system, and you can see that the timesheets are being approved but you can't see who it is that's providing that approval. So, um, and- So if I, if I could jump in here, so yep. I'm still working on that. We have a beta version from, from Telestaff who provides our timekeeping system. So we are able to, to run a test of that report now that, that the auditors requested. Um, hopefully we'll have that, that finalized in the next month or so to work out a few um, bugs with it. Um, but our intent is to not have it appear um, next year and we've, we've been working with the vendor on on that um, so i think i don't think you'll see it next year. 
Thank you. Thomas, did you have any? No, I have no questions. Great. I did want to comment on the letter that's to governance, um, the board, um, and it describes. Uh, Thomas, you sound like you're sick. I am. Uh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, Thank you. Um, in the letter to governance, it does describe a new accounting policy this year that was adopted by the district. Um, it did not impact your financial statements, um, but if there were a situation to arise where it did, then additional disclosures would be required. And that is for GASB, um, statement number 96, and it's subscription-based information technology arrangements. And so these are um, software leases, essentially. Um, that are for multiple years, more than one year, and um, they would result in additional assets and liabilities being recorded on the financial statement. Um, however, uh, thankfully, you didn't have any that rose to a material enough amount um, to need to be recorded. So I wanted to bring that to your attention as well. Okay. Thank you. That, anything else? That's all I have. Does anybody have any questions for me? Okay, no. Thomas, did you have anything? No, no questions. Okay. Kathy, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. If anybody has any questions, um, I believe that you do know how to get a hold of me here at Singerly WAC. Um, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to, to talk with you. Thank you. Thanks so much. We appreciate it. Yep, you bet. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye bye, Kathy. Hope you're feeling better, Thomas. Thank you. <laughs> Nicely done, Mark. Okay. Next up, we have a presentation of our insurance renewal with SDIS. Agent Director Jeff Griffin. We will invite Jeff with Wilson Hargate Associates to present on the insurance renewal. Bruce, thank you. Where would you like me to stand? Outside. Where would you like me to stand? I'm not asking that question again. <laughs> you had to know with this group, but you're going to hang the third ball, Jeff. Somebody's going to hang back to explain it. <laughs> so you noticed in your packet that it's getting pretty voluminous with this, the amount of equipment you have and the amount of buildings you have. Staff, although we are environmentally conscious and, and uh, recycle everything we can and have hybrid cars, I thought it might be easier if I actually brought the packet because there's one page that's noteworthy to review. Would you like this copy rather than to scroll through your? Sure. Oh, you're sure. In. <laughs> <laughs> this is the page that's really noteworthy. Um, and it's a, it's a great summary of the past and uh, your performance. Where I'd like to start is that uh, your staff, your leadership, uh, the board, you're doing everything right. Now, when you look at that page, you'll see that the rates changed about 14%. Each February, we do a budget projection. Mark goes through it with fine tooth comb and we make mm -hmm. our best guess moving forward. Now, usually over the last four decades, we've usually been within 1% of where we need to be. The last couple of years have been a challenge because the market has changed so much. But Mark hit it spot on. And the changes were not so much in rate, although the rates have gone up, and I'll talk more about that uh, in, in a moment. You didn't see that increase. But if you look at the page, what you'll see is significant changes in, in the, the data that's used to create uh, the premium, the tr premium triggers. Brought in um, Sandy Fire Department. Payroll went up about 13 million with some of that. Our buildings, our, our equipment values went up. So if you look at, at this graph chart that compares year over year, almost all of your change was not rate change. It was the rate triggers uh, that are used to calculate your premium. Payroll is liability. That went up quite 13 million bucks, roughly, and then buildings and equipment. So you performed extremely well. Most districts, and I saw Chris uh, just this last week, and he heard a very similar talk. Most districts saw about a 12 to a 18% increase just in rate. You did not see that. All of this is uh, in uh, uh, the, the triggers that cause the premiums. Mm -hmm. You're performing extremely well. Two of the things you want to look at very closely. Number one is you get your best practices, all 10%. That's critical. A, it reduces the premium 
which is good because we're spending taxpayer dollars. We always want to be as cheap as we possibly can with that cost. But it also tells the underwriters, you're doing everything you can to prevent the losses. Every year, SDO sets out where the 10% is going to come from. Every year, you max it out. And it tells the underwriters that you're loss adverse. It, it, it says you're spot on. The other thing you want to look at is your, your actual loss ratio. Uh, and it's very low. So you look, you look great to the underwriters. You're positioned right moving forward. Um, let me talk a little bit about the future and, and where I think things are going to go. To get closure on where we're at this year, there's a little bit of refinement that I'm going to work with Mark on. The early numbers have come in from SDAO that higher deductibles may make sense. We always do that point of diminishing return graph on where to be. And it looks like it may make sense because of the low frequency of accidents to raise our, our auto deductible and our property deductible. I'll keep you pushing on what that looks like. But we want to actually use those tools to not only just reduce costs, but calculate in future losses so that we're making money long term. And I think both of those are going to make some sense. We may recommend we raise the building deductible from five to ten. I don't have all the data back in, but that may make some good sense and raise our auto deductible from a thousand to maybe twenty five hundred. You're just not having the access. And that that I think would make make good sense long term. Our market is in an unusual place. Uh, usually we take a look at loss data and it's pretty easy to project where we're headed uh, for the next year or two. Uh, it's odd right now. And so I'm going to give you a, an interesting uh scenario but also for february but we hope to have the numbers pretty well nailed down again this this year for uh, for your budget purposes the things that are unique in the marketplace you're, you'll read in the industry that most of the frontline u.s insurers the mainline insurers the hartfords the liberties the travelers the chubs have actually done fairly well you'll see that the industry in the u.s lost about 26.7 billion dollars overall but the mainline insurers are doing pretty well. The reinsurers are still struggling a little bit with the, the large number, the frequency and the severity of the FEMA losses that you're reading about, the hurricanes and the wildland fires. But overall, if you look at what has happened the last couple of years with rates, we think that it's, it's going to crest and sometime around June, July, we think that it'll start to flatten out. Um, there are some things that are outside of the industry's control other than revenue in and claims paid out that could impact this year. And this is where it's a little bit interesting. Uh, first is uh, the reserves that they sit on. So what happens is syndicates, large families put money in, invest in the insurance industry that sits in a reserve account, allows insurance companies to write future premiums. You have to have money in reserves uh, in all 50 states. That money is being pulled out. A lot of that money is being pulled out and put into other places. Right now, you can make five, six percent in the bank. Why would they gamble to make five or six percent in the insurance industry? So we're seeing what's called an availability crisis. Money is leaving the industry now. We think it'll come back in uh, with a little bit of time. We think interest rates may be coming down the first part of the year, and in, uh, insurance may look more attractive with loss ratios, but. If we do have an availability crisis, that will drive rates up a little bit, but it also means that it's very important that we be loss adverse, which, which you are. At a 23% loss ratio, it says you're doing everything right. These times are where low frequency, low severity public entities shine and where ones that have had problems are charged. They, they see higher rates. The second piece that is a concern is a recession. We move into a recession, claims spike theft claims spike, liability claims, people that wouldn't file a claim before now are filing those claims, and uh, many of them legitimate, some of them not so legitimate. But if we go into a recession, usually we see the market spike, and that would drive uh, the process, the, the uh, renewal process. FEMA is still a big concern. For the last five years, the worst years in FEMA history, big, big claims. Um, and we're anxious to see what happens this next year with Hurricane, Wildland Fire, and the others. Uh, we're due for a break. It's long overdue, but uh, it is a concern. Those would be the things that are outside of our control. There's another piece that you need to be aware of, and that's the supply chain issue. You've seen it. Uh, it wasn't very long ago that you were spending five, six hundred thousand dollars on an engine company. Today, you're looking at a million one, million two uh, for an engine for a ladder company. 
you're looking at maybe $2 million, uh, which is unbelievable to think about. But we were also looking at huge delays, two and three years in some cases. We're seeing an awful lot of departments move towards refurbing, uh, taking a, a good rig and, and rebuilding that rig. The challenge with that is uh, the NFPA standard 1900, we're in regular dialogue with them. That standard gets rewritten here very soon. The, uh, Bill told us last month that the, the fire engines that uh, they ordered, that he ordered a few months ago, will go to production in January of 2027. <clears throat> A year ago. It's uh, it's crazy. <laughs> we don't have a choice but to refer today, um, and to wait that long for an engine company. And we're seeing open-ended bids. We're seeing companies actually come back and say, "Yeah, we'll build you one in 2027," but we don't know all of the cost. And there they have some out clauses. How do you budget for that? How do you plan for that? Um, supply chain is a, is a big issue. Uh, whether we're building buildings, uh, more important for our equipment. I, I, you were going to go on to a point about talking about NFPA 1900 and the liability associated with refurbs. So thank you, and I'll, I'll back up. So 1900 governs all of our fire apparatus, and there's a half a dozen, 1901, 2, 4, 7, uh, how we refurb, um, what is a new engine, how long it stays, uh, life expectancy on a new engine company. It's created some challenges for us, um, and our our hope is that as they rewrite the 1900 series, as they are just finishing right now, the 1500 series, the safety series, that will come out in July. Our hope is that they recognize, like we've done with ambulances in the past, we've just taken the box off of, and, and dropped it on a new glide kit, a, a new Ford 450, 550, whatever the case may be. Um, our hope is that they recognize those as new vehicles when they're rebuilt um, for life expectancy. Now it's a challenge. We don't know where they're going to go with it, but NFPA was not prepared for us to do what we have to do to survive right now. We want to have a fire wall between us and claims. What we don't want to have happen is a situation where we refurb a rig and the plaintiff's attorney says, well, we had an accident with that and it was an old rig. We want to have some good firewalls. Now, I do know that both of the uh, Northwest states, Washington and Oregon, are, are working on, on some standards statewide uh, to address that. But it is a concern. Uh, when we have to wait three, four, five years to get a rig, and we need rigs today, how are we going to put one in service? And, and the quickest way to do it, and least expensive way to do it, is a refurb. If it's going back to the Pierce manufacturer, it is it is pretty close to brand new all the way around. It should be labeled that. Did that address your thoughts? Yeah. I do want to think, uh, shift gears and talk about the things that we can do in preparing for next year. What we are seeing in the industry, heavy losses in driving vehicles. Now you do everything right today, but we want to really drill down and focus on that. Getting to the emergency scene safely, getting home safely, but our auto accidents uh, are a big concern with the insurers today and we want to stay in front of that power curve. You're not having a, a lot of auto claims. You're doing a great job. You've tuned down your tenders. We want to stay in that position. We want to be very focused on getting there safely and getting home safely. Auto accidents are a, a big piece. Cyber liability is a huge piece. And uh, right now, the frequency of cyber claims is pervasive. Uh, most recently, we had uh, a, uh, uh, another public entity held up um, where the cyber bandit came in, in and seized uh, their website. Uh, we were able to get it released back fairly quickly. Louis Bisbal was the law firm. It's, you know them nationwide. They do a lot of cyber work. They do a great job. But to get it released back, it was about $117,000 event just to get it done and, and, and get control back of it. The scary thing with that particular issue was the cyber band that seized the site. They weren't able to get into what we lovingly refer to as the black box, the off-site storage of the data, but they were able to, to damage it, blow it up, essentially. We've never seen that before anywhere. So that's a concern on how we store and, and where we're going to go with that. You're going to hear more uh, from us and from special districts and from a cyber specialist out of Florida that we use, and, and we'll be doing some area lectures on cyber. 
but cyber is a big deal. The big thing right now is diverting revenue, which falls under your theft policy. And I think that's at about a half million dollar limit. Uh, we had a claim earlier this year where um, they were buying a, a brand new ambulance uh, and the price tag on that was about $185,000. It wasn't a, a state-of-the-art, but it was a brand new rig. And uh, they took delivery of it, and the dialogue, the email dialogue back and forth with the vendor was, hey, you've got it, you know, accepting it, and they were going back and forth. And uh, the uh, vendor wrote, oh, by the way, you get your discount if you pay us within 10 days of receipt, I think is what they wrote. Emails went quiet for about 30 minutes, then they get another ping and it says, oh, by the way, uh, when we originally bid this out, we gave you the PO here, this bank, we've changed banks, this is the new bank, you're smiling, $185,000 went the wrong direction. So your staff is on that, we recommend highly that anytime you get a, a change uh, request, it's followed up with a verbal on the phone talking to the vendor saying, is this, is this correct? Um, that is our policy. And always call to you do it well. um, STO changed their cyber uh, piece. Uh, we're, we're right now revisiting that part. We applied for a higher limit. It was rejected as it was with almost all of the special districts members who went for a higher limit. Um, most everybody did not qualify for one reason or another. The new underwriting is very strict. Uh, we didn't because we had a potential claim this last year and a couple of other minor reasons, but we're looking outside of SDA for higher limits of, of cyber liability. We'll keep you posted on that. Um, it is it is a major, major concern. The other two areas where we really want to focus um, that are crit critical are employment practices. And usually in the past, I would talk to you about hiring, firing, promoting, demoting, but normally it was internal. It was our people. And that's not what we're seeing today. What we're seeing is a high number of situations where civilians uh, are attacking our fire personnel uh, at an emergency scene, unrelated to that emergency scene. Now, you'd expect it with a domestic violence situation where you roll in uh, with first in and you go in and, and a, uh, an angry spouse is there with a baseball bat. You'd expect that. We're prepared for that. What we're not prepared for is when we're working a scene and civilians across the street can move for an attack uh, on our, our personnel. Recently, I reported to you that we were in the Seattle area working and Seattle Fire reported 40 firefighters accosted in a four month period of time by civilians in unrelated calls. You see it right now in parking lots, you see it in, in restaurants, um, people are just angry. And uh, our big concern is how our people interface with civilians. Yours are well trained, but we want them to know how to get out of a caustic situation, but also how how to respond to the civilians so that we're not opening the door for potential suits of uh, of civil rights discrimination. Um, lastly, I want to talk about workers' compensation. Now, this renewal is not about workers' compensation, but I do want to plant the seeds moving forward. Uh, we've been working with SAFE, uh, and the chief knows this, for a little over 18 months on, on uh, presumptions, in particular post-traumatic stress. SAFE uh, most recently reported they were sitting on uh, 30 open claims, and they were struggling getting them closed. What uh, most states have some kind of pool organization. Washington has a group called Hell and I. Oregon has SAFE that ensures most of the state, but most states have a similar type of pool organization. And they meet on a regular basis and swap notes and exchange thoughts and, and processes. Um, earlier this year, they met in Chicago and it was reported by one of the states that their average post-traumatic stress claim was $830,000 to get a close, worse than anything we've seen as far as cancer. Now realize these are real claims. They're, they're uh, legitimate. Trying to get our people healthy for retirement and back to work is, is the key issue. Um, most recently, working with SAFE, uh, they reported that LNI uh, had stated that their average claim is about $650,000 per, per claimant. So we've been working with SAFE. SAFE's approved a five tier program of which you do most of those things currently, <clears throat> but a better pre hire piece, uh, a better orientation piece, a better prevention piece, and an enhanced claims process. Your staff is, and then equally important, is a pre-retirement 
the just prior to retirement, we get a, a lot of post-retirement type claims uh, that occur uh, when when people retire and, and lose lose their identity. We approach safe. We we put on a series of classes. Uh, one is by a group called Struggle Well. They're uh, owned by what's called Boulder Crest. It's a nonprofit out of New York. They've been here and lectured, and I know that several of your staff have have attended those. Uh, Heather, in particular, and then we had another individual named Dr. Donnie Hutchins uh, did it do a life work life balance piece. But Safe likes what we're doing. We've got five people back to work already in the state of Oregon that have gone through the process. So we're very excited about that. What I want to tell you just in preparation is the presumptions have the workers' comp carriers concerned. We need to, A, put our people first, get them healthy, keep them on the job, um, and we need to find ways to, to defer this. My biggest concern with any of these classes and trainings is the cost of the district. Now, SAFE is actually so uh, excited about the program. They've invested in the Oregon Fire Chiefs $150,000. We picked up $50,000 from special districts, another $150,000 from post from uh, EPSST. Uh, but the real challenge for you cost-wise is when we take a firefighter offline, we go through a day or two of training. My best guess is it's about $2,500 uh, in lost time. It's, we bring back another firefighter at time and a half, we have health care, uh, the ongoing PERS, all the other costs that add up. It's expensive. So we have to find some solutions to that. And I think we've got some good ideas to, to get that uh, handled. Uh, but we're working on, on preparing you for the future of uh, the expansion of, uh, of the presumptions. And I think that they're going to continue to expand over the years. So right now, about 25 states have post-traumatic stress. Oregon is one of them. Washington, California are two other states that, that have post-traumatic stress. Uh, and we want our firefighters healthy back at work. And uh, Jeff, is there any anything in there about like prevention? I mean, our, like, because like our peer program is phenomenal as can be. It's, it's so phenomenal. yes, so Heather's actually been engaged with us. Tim Deep does a great job. So there's 13 items of prevention. So each each of the five steps have different items, but uh, I don't have the list in front of me. I know you've seen it, but uh, we have a part on the pass down from shift A to shift B, trying to recognize issues. We have- uh, but, but is that gonna help us with our insurance liability or rates? And if we have a prevention program for stress? So, uh, I smile when you say that. Our ask was safe. Was anybody? Who, our program right now is a beta test, and I think Safe is going to assign twenty or thirty fire departments around the state to be a part of the beta test. Uh, our ask was anybody who's in the beta test should get a, re a reduced rate. They immediately said not going to happen, but it would be factored in at renewal time, uh, so it would give us a better argument. Big part of yeah, yep. So uh, we think it's going to be, we want to have you positioned right to have your rates, uh, the rate tier uh, as low as it possibly can be. And we want our firefighters healthy. So, but yeah, I think the prevention piece is going to be, I, I, everything would suggest that it's working right now. I think this is one of those, those occasions where to an extent, like you're planting the seed or planting the tree for the shade later. Like when we talk about onboarding folks, each step of their career, and then, and then pre-retirement, there's a lot of pieces that will will get folks to a good place, a good uh, processing mechanism and support mechanism that a lot of folks who are looking at retirement didn't have. And so while we may see some benefit in the short term, uh, I think when it comes to numbers and data, I think we're going to have to wait for that. But hopefully with the five-step process, or the, the folks that need assistance and get that even if it doesn't impact our rates directly in the short term but downstream i think you'll see uh well the intent is to see some reduction in well, maintenance on absolutely brian i totally get it i mean there's no like closing off your turnouts before you take off your mask i mean you get the carcinogen off it's all part of the program i was just thinking hoping that the industry would recognize the fact that if you have a stress program or if you have a decon program or whatever that you hear your people to that that would give you a point or two towards your uh, 
cost of doing that? It, it won't up front. Uh, SAFE has been clear with that, but we're entering this mid-year. Mm -hmm. In our position, we want to have you well ready as we get into the renewal cycle for 7-1 with workers' compensation. And uh, the thing that thrills us is that we've got five back at work already, which is a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. Heather's been, I think, at most of the classes, and I think you've had some other... You attended one of the I've classes. attended Heather, I believe, uh, Alicia. I think uh, Heather had... Three people go down the line, I believe. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, the sad thing is that SAFE and, and all of the state programs uh, like it, they have their protocols when claims occur. Uh, they have their approved list of, uh, of doctors and processes. And uh, unfortunately, um, they have not been able to get people back to work. So we go to SAFE, we file a claim, uh, they go through the panel of docs, our firefighters now start going to those doctors, they label, and they go forever to those docs and, and don't get back uh, to work. So this has been a stretch for SAFE, uh, but we're excited about where we're trying to head. Overall, what I would, I'm going to tell you in February is on the liability side, the property side, you're in great shape. Just keep doing what you're doing. And on the workers' compensation piece, we want to work hard to uh, address the, the uh, presumptions is where they're concerned. Covered a lot of ground tonight. Um, questions, concerns, thoughts? You and I talked to OFDB about the Boys of London challenge. Any, any more news on that? As far as where they're headed rate-wise, mm -hmm. I think Lloyd's uh, and I think the syndicates, Amri, Genry, Swiss Re, all of those big money companies, I think they're going to drift up until about May, June. Um, normally, there's a lag as they raise the rates before profitability gets gets back into the picture. But I think they're going to see that soon. I think they will see it here this uh, first quarter, second quarter. Already, the mainline insurers in the U.S. are starting to see some relief. And I think they will be profitable. Uh, I think they'll have what's called rate adequacy um, sometime by second quarter. And that's good for us because the liability comes up at the end of the year. And, and Frank will be renegotiating uh, rates with reinsurers October-ish. How painful is it going to be for us? I'm sure you don't know yet. Uh, if I were going to make a guess, I, I would tell uh, Mark to look at about a 12%, but I think it will be under that. I, I have more data I've got to collect, but I, I think it's going to be under that. I think the worst times are behind us. Mark and I talked earlier about, are we going to have this soft landing with the recession? If we have that, I think we're actually in pretty good shape moving forward. The things that are outside of our control is if we do have a bumpy landing, recession, and some other things that would drive the rates up. So, Jeff, you've mentioned net loss ratio mm -hmm. a lot and that ours is really good at 23%. Yeah. What exactly is that? Thank you for asking so that loss ratio is the dollars you pay in your premium versus the dollars they pay out in claims. So anytime you hit, they most of the insurance companies hit around 62, 65% plus their cost of doing business, their staff, their claims management, their the attorneys and whatnot. So 65, 68%, 62% in that neighborhood is normal. Workers comp is higher than that. So you're about a third of market. We we our company with public needs runs about the same, somewhere between 20 and 23 percent year in and year out. The workers' comp department is running better than I am, and I think they're lying to me, but they're at 19 percent. Thank you for smiling. I know that's unheard of, but that's where you want to be. You want to be on the low end. It allows us to leverage more downstream with rates, and that's why your rates didn't go up like a lot did. Most of your rate change was in growth in the department, more trucks, more expensive equipment. Thank you. If I were going to give you a mark, I'd give you an A plus from leadership, from uh, your management staff, but also our firefighters. They're doing a great job. Thomas, did you have anything? No, I no, I don't have any questions. Thomas, you're my favorite board member tonight. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I come up, now I, I need to do another safety lecture downstream to help get the 2% for next year, and we'll just plan on that whenever it's good for you. Oh, is there gonna, any uh, chance that they will 
give us our bonus back? I don't know if they canceled it. There's not, not going to oh. be rebate this year. I, I, uh, it will come back at some point. I don't think we're going to get it back for at least a year. Uh, there's some negotiations going on behind the scenes, and, and we found food helps with that, but uh, we're working on that real hard to get that back. Thank you. It's amazing how breaking bread uh, uh -huh. improves uh, that factor. Thank you for your hard work on OFDDA. Thank all of you for, I mean, you're involved in 15 or 16 different boards, I think. Uh, most important, thanks for your leadership here. Uh, it pays. Thank you, Jeff. Be safe. I will see you Wednesday. Yes. Remember, we're in a new facility. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't think I've seen you this week. I think I've seen you guys in January. You're talking about. Right? Yeah. I did not see you. Maybe not. Oh, no, yeah. I guess you're not. I think it's January. They've only got to come up. Well, remember, new place, and be sure to come early for dinner. <laughs> I will be there. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're on to our business. Uh, first up, we have a board approval for the annual audit. Uh, Mark, you're going to take that one? Um, yes. Uh, after her approval of the annual audit, I don't have to add beyond uh, the presentation. It's already occurred unless there are other other questions about um, the financial data. Okay. Why are we approving the audit? Why don't we just accept it? I mean... Yeah. Is there is there is that a magic word you have to no, it's not a magic word. I just wondered what it meant to approve the audit. I'm not second guessing. <laughs> no, that doesn't come from Kathy. That comes from past practice. I think of what what the board has done. Okay. Um, there's there's honest there's honestly no requirement that you even vote on accepting the audit. The audit is what it is. The the expectation yeah. that we presented to you and that you have your questions answered. Um, so this this can be you know one of those things that we no longer do going forward. Um, it's just have the audit presentation. If your questions are asked. It doesn't necessarily need a vote of the board. And just acknowledge that you received the audit. Yep. Chris, I have a question. Why? Well, how did the audit go? It went well. How did <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we yeah, um, like as Kathy said, they didn't find any deficiencies, and it, it went it went pretty smoothly. They um, we were ahead of schedule from, from last time, so we've been making improvements there, like Mark said. All right. And these guys all treated you good when you were looking on it? The auditors? These guys. Oh, these guys, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, since you're in the room, I want to ask. You, know, yeah. you don't get to see it very often. No, I think the biggest difference is we didn't have any any prior year adjustments, yeah. uh, which we saw the, the previous year with the new auditor. Um, and. Which, which was important that we, we caught those and got those straightened out. Good. Um, but this this year was good. Um, That's a successful program. <laughs> yes. So. Okay. Then then the whole vote part. Great. <laughs> uh, the next thing is uh, board approval of uh, insurance renewal with SDIS. Uh, well, you got that one too. I have that one too. Um, and so the current quote uh, is above the hundred thousand um, dollar threshold. So we are bringing that um, to the board to renew the insurance policy with SDIS as uh, Mr. Richard just presented. Okay. Any board member have any questions or comments? No. Right here. No. Do I hear a motion for the board to approve property casualty insurance with special insurance services for 2024? I think we just have to. Um, yeah, I think we just have to um, approving the chief's authority to enter a contract that's bigger than his normal, I think. That's good. So, Jack, what is the period? Um, should be in the book right there. The very back. Three forty nine. 
$349,737. And I do want to remind you that years ago we went to a flat fee basis, so we're not commissioned on that. So we took a, a reduced amount so that our revenue doesn't change uh, as they change. Okay, and within budget. That is within that is within budget. Um Would you like me to amend that to include the amount? Yeah. Okay. Uh, then I would read straight. Do I hear a motion for the board to approve property casualty insurance with special district insurance services for 2024 in the amount of $349,737? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second here. Else could you call the roll, please? Jay? Yes. Christ? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Marilyn, yes. Motion carries. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up is B3. Request board approved concrete replacement public works project for station eight and training. Uh, Michael's taking that one. Okay. Yeah. Hi, board of directors. So this um, concrete um, project is. The, uh, we, we conducted an ITV similar to the fencing project they did at Station 1. Um, this one actually had uh, a lot more interest in it. Um, I think it's partly due to just um, a tip in the market. A lot more contractors are looking for work right now. But we had uh, 16 bids come in for this one. Um, you can see a, a tabulation on, on one of the pages of, of all the different bids. And um, the lowest bid um, is Colton, um, Colton Holmes, who we are um, recommending for award for this contract. And um, and we did uh, point out um, the due diligence that we did um, to look up the history for this tender. Um, so we did see um, a few negatives on there that I noted um, on the on the memo, um, but. On the other other end of it, we reached out to um, to different uh, public agencies to to get their feedback on on their um, experience with them, and we received positive feedback from um, from three different project managers, uh, two from Clackamas County, and um, one from the uh, Multnomah County um, Drainage District. So. Um, and this uh, this project, uh, we're asking for $160,000, which would cover um, the scope of work that we mapped out um, within the IDB, which is the, um, the full scale and approaches prices for $97,000. Uh, plus, uh, it would allow us to do additional square footage at the uh, $19.70 price, which, um, which falls within our budget. Um, for the fiscal year, uh, we have $420,000 budgeted for concrete projects this fiscal year, um, of which we spent about $17,500. Um, and um, those were the yeah, those were the main points I wanted to go over. And I'm happy to answer any questions if any of you have any. Chris, yeah, Jay, go ahead. First of all, thank you for calling those people and asking them about the how they felt about their work. That's important. And just because somebody has the lowest bid doesn't mean it's, doesn't mean it's the one we're going to go with if they don't have uh, if they don't produce some good quality work. So I really appreciate knowing that. <coughs> that would be my first question is how what kind of data. Yeah. Uh, the other thing too is if we have that much in the budget, is there any other concrete we need to do? I mean honestly, I mean if, if we the Work with materials and labor costs are going up. I mean, if we need, we got concrete work we need to do in 2025, we're going to come back and it's going to cost us more money. Is there more concrete work we need to do? We've, we've talked about that. I'll leave it uh, for, for Chief Huffman, but that's been one of the considerations that Chief Waker's really brought forward is uh, nothing's getting cheaper. And if we have if we have the funds that we should be looking at this project to, to maximize our dollar, dollar that we have. But you talk about, because, you know, I, I think about, I don't know if we have any, how many, but I think about those concrete, well, those, with the uh, walkways and stuff, sometimes they're uneven and they just need to be ripped out and replaced. We don't even think about some of those little, little trip hazards and crap like that. We have in older structures, 
So, <clears throat> yeah, we, we actually have quite a bit of uh, repair work that's needed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we chose this location as the most damaged, mm -hmm. you know, 40,000 pound fire engines driving over it all the time at the training center and at station eight, <clears throat> which is a fairly busy station um, that rises up to, to the priority. But in uh, your remark to getting more done, we do have uh, flexibility in this contract to add more, as Michael said, with the 19 dollars a square foot, and we plan on doing that, okay. uh, especially in the 130th campus. It's It's got a lot of work that needs to be done. Well, I was just thinking that some of that little <coughs> minor stuff, like small chunks of uh, sidewalk or whatever, you know, that maybe that maybe or maybe not the captain would be captain who told you guys about you know, those kind of things. Well, I, I think another notable uh, part of this this uh, this report is that the contamination we have at the 130th campus <clears throat> with the use of the firefighting foam and the PFAS contamination, we do have a separate ask that will be coming to you for about 150,000, which is in the report for uh, mitigation. And uh, we're trying to stay on the on the front side of that and do the right thing so we don't get caught later. Um, we don't want to you know, pay for that at a later time. The same reason it'd be much more expensive right. <clears throat> so i think we're in a good position to get quite a bit of repair done at that uh, price point that we got and uh, moving forward i think um, it's also the project management time it takes to do these processes and that's kind of where we're uh yeah. slacking behind just a little bit but we're doing a lot more this year than last year okay very good cool thank you Oh, um, so Michael So on the disposition of the contaminated concrete, I'm kind of confused about the, the, the process of doing this. You're going to dig it up, then you're going to park it on the property while Colton does this other stuff, and somebody else comes and gets that. So you're recontaminating a different piece of the property by storing contaminated stuff that you just dug up. So. I mean, I I guess I'm confused about the the processing, the process that's been laid out of getting rid of the contaminated concrete. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there is a lot of the, the process of, of testing, and we also um, are looking at, we want to make sure we're only hauling off contaminated at that right. price. So we're going to do a little extra testing as needed. But, uh, but to your point, yes, the process of I mean, it to have both of the agencies there at the same time is, is challenging. So they, they do this and they feel comfortable with the process. And uh, most likely they're going to put it on other, I'm not going to even say that out loud, but they, uh, uh, they have a process for that and we're looking uh, at it to make sure we don't cause any contamination. Well, I don't want that contaminated stuff sitting in there for two years Neither while we let yes. another bid. <laughs> and, and that's not the plan for this. We're going to uh, cut in the hall. As we do it, we, and that's confirmed now. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I'll just add that my understanding about um, like it, it won't just be like sitting on on concrete, but they're going to be loading it into like roll out bottom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And realistically, what's what's entered the concrete isn't going to leak out of the concrete very quickly. You're not going to have like. But you'll have dust. Which will have a particular yeah, you're, you're gonna have dust. They'll they'll probably depending on what it is, they'll probably water when they when they break it apart. But generally just sitting there, it's it's not gonna leach a whole lot of that contaminant out of the concrete and then at the amount of time it's good. Yeah, because I don't want to make it worse for our firefighters. Right. right now you right. have a capsule oh, and you're gonna cut into this in capsule problem. It's gonna go <laughs> dust everywhere. Which people is that going to breathe or have on their their cars or their vehicles or whatever. And so um, feeling it's like asbestos, so they, it's a real to free this stuff. <laughs> so I want I want it gone as soon as it can But I would also like to say, Michael, you did a great job. It, it's really admirable for uh, what you've done. I, um, you know, when you get a, a bid like this, it's so out of whack with everybody else's. You some you kind of go wow hmm, what did they forget or whatever so I I think that you did the extra work to make sure that that, that they were legitimate and on and on right to do that and as long as we get those payment and performance bonds from quality bonding companies I think it's a great job that you've done thank you Thomas did you have anything 
No, no, nothing. Thank you. No, I'm just the same thing, Michael. I really like the bid, the way you pulled it together. It makes it nice and easy. And I like the comparison because I looked at I looked at the numbers, and you you get outliers. I mean, the guy that wants eighty dollars a square foot, <laughs> yeah, he's got a house house payment due, and it's one of those jobs. You know, sometimes you just throw a number at something and you get it. You know, you make money at that because you can. But just seeing that, because I see another one that somebody came in at twenty one fifty. So you haven't done this a lot. It's not out of the realm, and if can tabulate like that, it makes it nice and easy to kind of compare everything. So thanks for doing that. Uh, do I hear a motion for the board to authorize the fire chief to enter into a contract with Colton Holmes for concrete repair in the amount of one hundred sixty thousand dollars? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Ariel, could you call the roll, please? Chris. Yes. Thomas. Yes. Marilyn. Yes. Jay. Yes. Motion carries. We'll pick some concrete, guys. <laughs> um, <clears throat> next up, we have other business board committee liaison reports. Uh, executive committee director and president hearing director Hawes. Oh, that would be me. Um, the executive committee, the biggest thing was the executive committee went to the down to the coast uh, last month and we had kind of a retreat and did some great long-term planning to discuss some of the issues that are that are coming up in front of the board. And, and I think as much as anything, just got to know each other better. And that was really nice. Uh, we found out that Brian cheats at Marbles. <laughs> um, Steve's no fun whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, but generally, we had a we had a really good discussion about uh, some upcoming uh, the upcoming issues we have. Um, it was a nice time. I don't know if there was anything else that uh, that was about it. Mm -hmm. right, next, uh, foundation liaison director Cross. I was unable to attend the meeting as well. So I want to make some note. Up. No report. <laughs> no. I was hoping Andrew would be here, and then he could report for me. Um, he's going to be MIA as well. So, okay. Well, next is interagency committee, and ask Director Joseph Thomas. What do you have? Uh, we didn't have a meeting. I was, I was out for course. Uh, oh. We haven't had a meeting of the any IGA since last meeting. Steve, do you remember? We didn't. We didn't have a Saturday meeting. After the board meeting, right? No, we did not have one in, in November. Yeah, and there was one scheduled for Gladstone, but that was canceled. Uh, okay, it, it, it was, and uh, I was just exchanging emails with Jackie today about trying to reschedule for uh, back half of January. Okay, that's that's good. All right, um, I would just you know throw out I've been going to the Sandy <clears throat> Sandy Fire Board meetings and. They're really happy. They're all very happy. And I've also talked to the mayor several times that that town is very happy with the service they're getting. And Phil's doing a great job selling us out there. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, informational updates, comment. Any board have any informational updates or comments to share? Um, I would just throw in for me, January 5th, I'm going to get a new right knee. So our next board meeting, I think, shows up the day of my three-week post-op. So if I am at the meeting, it'll probably be on Zoom. Because I may or may not be running marathons yet by then. But I can do five minutes on a treadmill, by God. <laughs> and then die. <laughs> yeah. Chris, did I hear that you're running a marathon? <laughs> I'm sure that's what you that heard. Thomas, <laughs> you're just kind of hitting the high spots. <laughs> you're having your I own have, little it's yeah. right. I have a very poor audibility. I mean, sound is so bad. <laughs> I can barely hear everything. So anyway, I thought yeah. I heard something about marathon. No, I just said I'm not going to run any marathons lately. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, so our next up is the Office of the Fire Chief, and we're gonna have a Chief Brian Stewart taking this one forward. All right, okay, sir. Uh, much like Chris, 
somebody else today. Ryan, uh, I missed, uh, I can hear. Jay, did Yo. you get the final number about the auction? Negative. Negative? Okay. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. Oh, you're, you're perfect. Uh, well, I wish I had brought the final number of the auction with me, but I didn't. A uh, couple of things I wanted to chat, uh, just just touch on. First, it's it's uh, it's that holiday time of, of year, uh, and it's been fun seeing uh, everybody in the organization and out in the community uh, just enjoying themselves differently. Uh, and much like you talked about, like like the retreat, you just there's just been a little bit uh, different different feel and flavor for things. Uh, I would touch on Opsana a little bit because that was a big success this year, but I suspect that Ryan's going to do a little bit of an update on that. However, I will fill Nick's role and take over uh, something for Steve here. So let me talk about recruitment. Uh, so so come, come Thursday, we have a graduation ceremony for, for our existing academy. We'll be seeing 14 recruits come out of that, uh, 1 o'clock at, at Camp with come if you want to make it. But for the firefighter recruitment, uh, we had 446 uh, applications submitted. So that is, that's, a, that's a great number. We had over 10,000 views of it. Uh, and it's the most number of applicants for firefighters that we've had since we've started NeoGov. So going back to that, that's that's as, as many as we've had. Uh, and they've been uh, seen from across the country in Texas, Utah, Washington, California, Nevada. So kind of really successful uh, recruitment from our perspective uh, to start with. A lot of it has to do with the implementation changes that uh, uh, Chief Dieters and his team have been working on over a period of time of reducing the barriers to entry and making more access to things, but I'm sure he'll touch on that. Not now. Not now. Uh, anyway, just a couple pieces uh, there. Um, and that's that's the report. It's been a, a lot of things in process with other folks in the room, whether it's finance, uh, facilities, IT, those things. Good. Thank you. Anybody have any questions or comments from Ryan? No. Oh. Next up is Office of Community Services, and then Ryan. Oh, all right. Well, hey, talking about things being in process. Uh, so a few things uh, to, to share about. So we haven't talked about it much, but I want to just kind of give you a status update about what IT uh, is working on and where we're focusing our energy. Uh, now that we've gotten through the thrust of, uh, of onboarding uh, implementation uh, pieces. So we're still working on um, moving the Sandy uh, stations to our D1 net. Uh, that's a process that's been ongoing. We're working on that piece. Uh, we are also working on uh, a couple pieces for uh, efficiency and also cybersecurity, one of which is virtualization of our servers. So we were due to do some hardware upgrades this year uh, for our, uh, our servers. Uh, we're looking at a different path uh, to put those into a virtual private cloud uh, and going through that, that costing process at the moment. But I think that's the direction that we're going to end up heading. Uh, two other things. Uh, we're also looking to uh, convert our major uh, cellular carrier from Verizon uh, to FirstNet, uh, which is a, uh, a product uh, and band, cellular band specific for public safety. Uh, with that, we expect to see some significant uh, savings from the data plans. Voice plans are about the same, but we expect to see some significant data plan savings um, on a on year over year basis. Uh, and then we are preparing for a, a major upgrade for our NBCs. So much like going instead of from you know Windows 10.8, we're going to go from Windows 10 to Windows 11, essentially in, in the uh, the Central Square world. So that should be coming over in the first part of next year. But there's a lot of background work that's being done to uh, test those systems. So uh, our service provider has been heavily involved in all of those pieces and is leading the way. Uh, on those and they're helping us with a cybersecurity grant. Uh, so we have just done the first application process. We don't know where it's going to head yet, but uh, we are very attuned to cybersecurity and we're concerned and looking towards that. A um, couple other small pieces to touch on. Uh, Jeff was here earlier. Uh, he may have you may have heard him mention it before the meeting, but OFCA has had some change uh, in leadership, not just on the board, but also our executive director, or excuse me, managing director has changed. So it used to be Ed Wilson, who was the, the chief over in Portland and Lake Oswego. Um, he's retiring from, from that. And Dave Pickard, uh, who retired out of uh, Redmond, uh, is going to be the managing director. And with that, uh, we're changing that scope a little bit. Uh, and he'll have a, a bigger piece in helping guide uh, the legislative pieces for the uh, Oregon Fire Chiefs. 
Um, this short session, uh, we do we are not engaging the lobbyists for their their efforts. We uh, are, are kind of resetting uh, our legislative efforts, but we've done a really good job under Chief Johnson's leadership of um, connecting with our stakeholders and making sure that we're tuned to what uh, our stakeholders, yes, them, but also our partners, uh, partner agencies and, and associations, uh, making sure that we're collaborative and understanding the landscape uh, that's out there. Uh, one of the items under there that, that you may hear more about is a sustainable wildfire funding proposal. Um, this is coming out of uh, Rep Steiner's office, um, and that was presented to the wildfire Advisory Policy Council today. Um, it's a significant one, and it looks at uh, imposing a fee in lieu of property tax across the state per parcel. Um, and so we're, we're being very attentive to it. Um, I did not make the meeting today. I know Chief Brown is upon it, so we'll have more uh, on that coming up shortly. Um, but there's that. There's a couple of other uh, significant funding uh, legislative concepts out there that we're, we're participating in and being attentive to. Uh, lastly, um, from my from my neck of the woods, two things. Uh, we've been participating in school reunification with Gladstone, uh, so building up to a uh, top exercise that we expect to start next year. Um, and then uh, Jeff had also mentioned the uh, 500 behavioral health piece. Um, so I serve on uh, one of the state councils for that, and we expect to have our recommendations to the governor's fire service policy council in January. Uh, much of what he talked about with this five-step program, uh, kind of a structure of that will be uh, suggested in there. Um, so that's the updates I have. Facilities will be covered by Chief Huffman. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Anybody have any questions for Brian on this one? Thomas? No. Okay. Uh, next up, Office of Business Services, Chief Peters. Thank you, Vice Chair. Pause. I'm not going to lie, I up anymore. A um, few things to highlight. Uh, community services, uh, most of November, they're, the last part of November, they're setting up for Operation Santa, which uh, happens in, in a good part of December, and that has happened. And in January, uh, Chief Wiley will come and do the, the final wrap-up and give totals and, and things like that. But for the most part, it went very, very well. It was the first time in Sandy, and uh, Director Hawes was able to uh, come with us. Uh, I was surprised at how many people came out, and uh, then we did the drop off there, and that went well as well. Lots of participation, and uh, so it was it was a good time. Lots of lots of positive feedback on social media, and thank yous for for doing it. They've never had anything like that out there, so it was it was pretty impressive. Um, and Brian spoke about the recruitment. We had a measly 446 supply. I was really hoping for the 500 mark, but it was nice to see the things that we'd implemented in the apprentice process. We were, which was not civil service. We were able to get those uh, things pro into the civil service process, and you were part of that that transition there. So. Uh, really proud of the fact that we were able to get all of that done, and so we'll see where it goes from here. Now we have to narrow it down to 150, so uh, it's going to it's going to be a, a task, but we'll we'll get there. And uh, we also had a process for human resource program specialists. You know, Amanda um, Hillenbreck had left uh, the the organization, and we're looking to fill hers. We did get 30 applications for that spot, so uh, we've narrowed it down to the top 13, and they'll be interviewing the week after Christmas, and we're hoping to make a job offer by the first week of January or second week of January, and uh, go from there. Uh, the FMO staff, they've seen a, an uptick in the building finals plans review and those and, and acceptance testing and engineering and architectural, uh, all part of what they normally do. We're starting to see an uptick in that. They did 77 last month. So good part of Sandy is, is helping with that. There's a, some construction starting to happen out there. So that's starting to help. And then they're also doing their annual schools inspections for Sandy, Oregon City, and uh, Gladstone, Boring, all of the areas of <clears throat> Clackamas. So they're working on that. And then one final thing to add is this is the last board meeting that uh, Chief Schneider will be expected to go to. Yeah. Not, not saying he won't show up, but... Uh, uh, this is his last one. He will be retiring at the end of January, and so he probably won't be here for, uh, or I mean, I'm sorry, the end of December. Uh, so he won't be here for that. He does have a plan, or so he thinks, that he's going to come back and help as a, as a volunteer and 
we can't find any reasons to keep him from doing it just yet, but I'm still working on that. And uh, but it's been great to have, have him along. And uh, anyway, I didn't know if he wanted to say anything to you guys or anything, but uh, this will be his last one expected to come to. Yeah, no, just thanks to opportunity. It's been great, it's been a great partnership, and uh, it's been a good six months. Thank you. Thank you. Bill, I know we've all appreciated just how much you have led the effort out there. This is a transition like this, as we all know, can go one of two ways. And this one has went absolutely glass smooth. And you're a lot of that. We appreciate it. Yeah, so this is very happy. Go be retired for a while. Yeah. If you want a list of things to do instead of coming to work, come and see me. I'll help you. <laughs> we'll go get in some mischief. And we absolutely know much more than six months what you did out there to to help the citizens of Sandy, you know, with what you guys are trying to achieve, what we're all trying to achieve together, and, and with your board that you had at Sandy Bar too, that was so, so, that was a career well done, my friend. Thank you very much for your for your service. Thank you for your career. Thank you for what you did for City of Sandy for all the number of years. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we will be sending the notice. We are gonna recognize Chief Schneider uh, at the end of January, at a retirement party, we'll be at the main station there, but we'll send out all of you guys the, the details so you can put it on your calendars. And I will say that he selected the first date was our board meeting night. And... So are you going to actually make a museum out of his office? Well, he's taking all that with him. So Where's he going to put it? <laughs> um, down in the annex basement with all the other <laughs> so what, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think he's been adding to it, actually. I think he's bringing stuff from home. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be empty now too quick. Actually, Brian, I have an operations question for you. Maybe it's next month, but I, uh, I understand there was uh, two fairly large fires here recently in Sandy that happened, one right on top of the other one, the second one, a two or three hour commercial fire that will the y'all you come now, Gresham and a whole bunch of other folks came to that? Yeah, I, I don't think it went to a second. Okay. Um, it was engine 371 was on a house fire. We had a bunch of stuff there, and then that came in, and Gresham was the, the closest available, and then everybody started coming. And actually, 371 was just about to clear, when, and they they actually went to the commercial fire. Yeah, they, they ended up clearing a little bit after. It was the, the first fire came in a little bit before rescue 371 was on duty. Uh, and then shortly after the second fire propped up, they were able to, to cut loose from, from the first scene. Mm -hmm. Everything went. We were able to prepare to handle two fires at the same time fairly well. It, it, absolutely, yes. yes. And uh, we plan to give details in December. Or in January. Yeah, in January. Yeah, yeah, January. Yeah, January. I, I kind of figured as much. Yeah. I figured it was a little premature. Yeah, there's a couple other other yeah. notable things that we'll let off share that in January. Okay. Yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you. Well, did you have any more for Steve? Thomas? Yes, yes, sir. Did you have just, a question? Just, nope. Okay. I really don't know why he comes to these meetings. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Office of Financial Services, um, Officer Mark Whitaker. Okay, hello again. Um, so the finance report, page 126 of your packet. Uh, notable things in there is, of course, the month of November brought in um, the first uh, property tax revenue for the current year. Um, and so you can see the first effects of the, the levy funds. Um, and that property tax revenues are much higher than they were um, the year before. Cash is much higher than it was the year before. Um, and that's, uh, we also then saw in the first weeks, couple weeks of December, an additional $15 million in, in property tax come in. Um, so we're, we're trending well uh, with where we expect to be. Um, I don't think I ever covered um, with the board where we were on, on assessed value. So in October, the assessor's office published the official assessed value number for um, for this fiscal year. Um, and it, it, it's interesting and has some nuance this time around. For, for one, now that we have a levy, we, we're, we're kind of tracking two different assessed rates, right? So the, the levy amount will be based on our total assessed value because the levy is not subject to the urban renewal loss. Um, so our overall assessed value that the level uh, grew 4.45% uh, um, compared to last year. And then our net assessed value after you take off the renewal um, actually grew at a higher rate at 4.6%. And that's kind of a one-time phenomenon because of 
um, Oregon City returning, at least temporarily returning the, their urban renewal value back to, to the other local governments in the area. So they were returning 100% of the value this fiscal year and 75% uh, of that value in, in the next fiscal year. And unclear after that, presumably they, they would either go back to um, collecting the full 100%. So we're, we're gonna kind of see a, a one-time, potentially one-time spike in in our, our revenue, roughly $500,000, $600,000 from that, that Oregon City money coming back in. Um, if we didn't have that, that one-time spike, our net AV would have grown at 3.6%. Um, so still above what we budgeted, but not exactly um, robust, uh, which uh, raises some concerns about, you know, how much development and growth we'll have um, in, in the near term. So, uh, but for this year, we're, we're trending uh, very well on revenue. Uh, like I said, at 4.45% at of the levy and 3.6% uh, ongoing for the, for the net, that those are both above budget. So we, we should be fine from a revenue perspective. Um, Expenses are trending fine. The other thing I would highlight um, is on page uh, one one twenty nine is is the investment report. Um, so as I did as we did last year um, with the the bulk of property tax revenue in um, invested some of that in in treasuries and federal agency bonds. Um, the spreads are not are not great. You know the the local government investment pool is currently providing interest rates at five percent. You know the treasuries are are anywhere from five point zero five percent to five point one five percent, but the expectation is that interest rates will will go down, um, and so it's it's good to lock in those those rates where we could. Um, also, as we discussed, I believe um, in November or yeah November meeting, also invested in some uh, bonds with a maturity greater than one year, uh, so that we have those funds invested and they'll they'll mature in time to buy. By the engines and, and pay off the loan um, when, when those mature. So that's the end of my report, unless there are questions. Okay, Jamie, Marilyn. About um, the final page, um, I just want to clarify page 130 the interest rates, those numbers relate to what? The treasury? Yeah, sorry, that page did not format correctly. Um, I just noticed that. So, so yeah, each it, it should be linked to the the previous page. So each of those each of those bills and bonds that table was meant to be on a, on a single page. So, so those are the the interest rates for for each of the the treasuries and bonds listed on the previous page. And so you can see the longer term ones actually fall below five percent, um, but that that last one at four point six four percent that's a that's a three that's three years. Um, so we've locked in that rate for three years and um, I feel comfortable that, that that'll perform well compared to the interest rates. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thomas, did you have any questions? No, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Office of Emergency Services, Division Chief Rick Huffman. Rick, what do you have for us? Uh, good evening again. <sighs> Well, Chief Mulek has taken some well-deserved time off, um, but as you said, as we heard uh, this month, we've had some significant fires, and, and we we did in November also. Um, you know, most of them are just the house fires, but what I can say is, and I know Chief uh, Mulek would echo this, is that our, our crews are having a really fast and efficient response and um, and getting a quick initial attack on these fires, and there's consistency in the reports on that, which I think is pretty amazing. That says a lot about the whole system, and, and whether everybody in this room versus the training and, and things that they're doing. But it's really good to hear. You know, there's a lot of talk about morale and in, in the fire service nationwide. But I can tell you, I think our people are doing amazing. Um, and there's a lot of prep uh, that has been done in November, continuing this month uh, for operations in January as we try to restructure um, the operations and the management of. of of all the needs of operations, and we're looking forward to that. More to report next month. Um, I can uh, say that we we uh, received a grant from SHSP from the state of Oregon, the state home and security program, and we received sixty thousand dollars to increase our uh, multiple multiple casualty incident training uh, throughout the district. So that more to come on that, but that was a, a, a an almost unexpected award because we got that applied back in the summer. So. Thought they forgot about us. Um, 
For facilities, uh, our capital forecast, as you've heard with the concrete project has been pretty good. We're doing really well. We're trending well with our capital funds and, and projects. Um, and that's really about it. Everything's kind of in motion right now. Not, not too much to talk about completion, but if you have any questions, we'd love to take them. Okay. Any questions for Chris? Thomas, go ahead. Hey, Rick. What, what, what is specifically the targeted for that $60,000 grant? I wasn't quite clear when I read the report. The, um, this is actually part of the virtual training that we we uh, trialed at the multi-agency training uh, earlier in the year. Uh, it was received really well, and it is a priority on the national uh, strategic uh, goals for these, these funds to be used. I mean, this multi-casualty incident can be anything, but obviously for FEMA and Homeland Security, it, it relates to either terrorism or acts of violence. So this actually will fill the void on all of that. I think uh, Director Cross would agree that our uh, multiple casualty incident response needs uh, a fresh look and uh, and how we respond. Unfortunately, it's becoming more, more prevalent. So uh, it's the sixty thousand is is mainly for development of the virtual program and the hardware to deliver that program. So Thomas, is this a one-time grant? It is, yes, and no matching funds. Thomas, if you remember a few months ago when we had our um, EMS committee meeting, um, uh, the chief brought in those, those two great big um, uh, hard boxes on wheels that weighed about 100 pounds a piece, and they were the virtual reality stuff, and he was going to let us uh, put them on and play with them, but you had another meeting to go to. Yet that's what he's replacing those. I got to stick around and play with them though. <laughs> and they're great, but they're old and they're they're old technology. And so that is what they're that, that's what he's replacing. It allows the firefighters to put on the goggles and uh, do virtual training that is pretty awesome. Even the old technology is pretty awesome. Uh, and they don't um, well, they don't have to have actual bad sick patients in front of them or real fires in front of them or whatever it but it looks like they do so it's pretty cool it's pretty cool it's definitely uh evolutionary revolutionary so i think uh implementing some of the technology is, is something that we're going to benefit from from a lot of reasons uh, for exposures to mental health but it's also something we got balanced really well you know to we don't want to take away any hands on training but we want to add what we can the technology. This will give us a first step. Thank you, Rick and Jay. Good. Okay. Anything else? Mm -hmm. uh, and we took off Andrew because Andrew's not here. Next up, we have Volunteer Association uh, a report from Volunteer Coordinator Ryan Gregoro and President Jerry Carney. Ryan, you go first. Thank you, Vice President Hodge and uh, directors. Uh, it's a little bit about what happened in November. Uh, we reviewed some driving policy. Uh, then we planned Operation Santa as our second drill, uh, just kind of getting that implemented. We're in a significantly different state than we were last year when we were planning Operation Santa. We were begging that we're going to have enough volunteers to uh, help out. And this year we, we did really well with volunteer participation. Then we had an EMS drill, and then uh, to save the families, that the support of volunteers, we gave them a break on Thanksgiving Eve and didn't conduct a drill that night, uh, which my wife appreciated as well. Um, report a little bit on station coverage. Uh, station 12 had 19 out of 30. Station 74 had 20 out of 30. And then Station 2, Rehab 302, had 7 out of 30. Rehab 321 had 8 out of 30. But with Chief Stewart's help and Ariel Roberts' help, they were able to generate a cool report that comes out of ESO. And last month, the rehab units were requested four times. We responded 100% of the time, four times. And we actually made it to the scene twice without getting canceled. So the other two were incidents that were not as severe as they anticipated on dispatch. So uh, thank you very much for that report and Chief Stewart for, for prompting that. and. Uh, uh, that's useful because that shows that we're meeting the need. 
Um, on a side note, on those fires in East County, those double fires in Sandy, we had three volunteer water tenders, 9,000 gallons of water responding to each of those incidents, uh, which was amazing. Two out of station 14 were volunteers, and then station 71, they picked up uh, the reserve tender and took it out there as well. So, yeah. Uh, so we're doing a good job. Uh, next month, we'll wrap up Bob Santa, which was uh, a whirlwind, but uh, it was fantastic as usual. I'll let uh, President Kearney uh, share about what's going on, unless you have any other questions. Do you have any questions for Ryan? Thank oh, you, Ryan. Oh, on a side note, uh, we started Explorers. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Who's the coordinator? So, uh, I'm the coordinator. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I also have two uh, two active volunteers uh, that came out of uh, the Sandy uh, Explore program. Uh, Eric Pettis and Glenn Yeager are kind of my two point people that are they're leading it, uh, but they they fall under my purview. They're training out of Station 14, which has been kind of fun to get them set up. And they did a little search drill uh, the other night, just in the tower, and went into the Conex box maze a little bit. So. Uh, they're pretty excited. So you, did, did you hear what Pat McCabe was doing? Who ran the, the program of Gresham for years? Did you hear what he's doing now? No, I didn't. He's a probie, a probie at Hoodland now. Is he? No, that's fine. That's, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> he retired from Gresham. He got hired at Hoodland. Now he's a probie. <laughs> Any other questions? No. I'll be getting on my program. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. Gary. Hey, members of the board. Some of this is going to be repetitious, uh, but I want to close some boxes so I open lots of things. Um, first, we did have our dinner auction. Um, pretty well attended, but it could have been better. Uh, pretty, pretty profitable, but should have been better. Um, as Ryan mentioned, we had our ops and review. Uh, to prep us for for me the 16th Hop Santa and uh, this was the different front pages and uh, not quite as broadly covered. Um, I mentioned last meeting that uh, the foundation and suffered fraud. Uh, all of those funds have been returned to the foundation uh, with the bank being listed as the uh, uh, victim, not the foundation, and the sheriff's office is pursuing it. Uh, from what I am gathering, and this is no shot at the sheriff's office, uh, it's a hard, hard nut to crack. Um, on a personal note, I participated in two upstandings. One in Sandy was outstandingly wonderful. Uh, couldn't get over the number of people that were out on the street just to see us. And uh, that, that was encouraging. Um, also encouraging is the fact that uh, due to uh, Sandy volunteers uh, attending our uh, association meetings, uh, our association attendance is well up, and we're not worried about having a quorum present to uh, conduct meetings. And um, <clears throat> lastly, uh, on behalf of both the association and the foundation, I'd like to vote to wish everyone here a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I have nothing else to report. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, you reported last month, Jerry, that there was a little problem with the IRS and the foundation name. Has Thank that you. been fixed? That, that has been resolved. <clears throat> the, uh, a positive the, way. <laughs> <laughs> the attorney that uh, represented the, the foundation in 1993, uh, apparently has passed away. However, his firm is still in existence. They were able to uh, dig up all of the supporting paperwork 
that had been sent to the various taxing entities. And uh, IRS uh, released the funds about two weeks ago. Very good. good. So that's, they are now in the foundation's hands. But uh, I, I know you're an attorney. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I can go back to 1993 and find anything. <laughs> Larry's never throw anything away. <laughs> just ask my husband. <laughs> um, just so everybody else knows about the fraud thing that happened with the foundation, uh, Jerry and Don did kept let me know about that. And they also, as the liaison to the foundation, they let me know about that. And they also let me know the process that they were taking to mitigate that. And because everything was seemed to be working the way it's supposed to, um, I basically told Jerry, I don't think we necessarily need to let everybody know about it unless there's a problem because everything was working. Unfortunately, this day and age, that kind of thing is the cost of doing business to some degree. And because it wasn't gonna cost us any money, at the end of the day, we were, the bank was gonna make it right. I chose to just let the foundation deal with that unless there was a problem then we could, we could bring it to the rest of the board. But since there was no problem and things were going swimmingly, um, we kept it, we kind of kept it on the down low to see how it would play, just let it play out. So, and I apologize to all of you <clears throat> for mixing my roles, but I'm president of both organizations and you're involved in both organizations. I thought that uh, it would be a good idea to uh, close the box. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Jerry. Any questions? Thomas, did you have anything for Jerry? Well, I, I just want to thank Jerry for his continued hard work on the foundation. Relentless work, I appreciate it and comment on that. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, up next, next correspondence. Uh, I hope everybody looked at those. There's some really nice yeah. letters in there. And yeah. some, some thank yous from Kentucky for Crew 30. That's, that's pretty impressive to have that kind of feedback. Hey, speaking of Crew 30, since you brought it up. I know that they had done their two weeks and they were supposed to take the stand down time, but they wanted to keep them. And somebody was working to try to get them to take their R and R in Kentucky so that they could stay for two more weeks or something. Did <laughs> that ever play out or what happened there? I think I believe they all came back. I they did. They didn't let them stay. They, never extended. they didn't let them stay. Yeah. I knew there was some interest in letting them there, but I think it was the state that wouldn't let them stay. That's what I heard. I don't know if true. Yeah. That. But Oh well, I thought that was awesome though. That they got <laughs> oh, great. and that they wanted to stay longer. So, John, excellent group. Can I go for this? One for Chief Peters. Um, other departments in the area are having a real hard time getting applicants. Portland, Gresham. What what is you know Clackamas done that's different and <laughs> encourages people to apply? And a second question is: um, I see Metro West is Metro West supplementing AMR now in Clackamas County. But I would like that be a question for you with yeah. the AMR. And Sam, we're signed a contract with Metro West for one unit to help cover when there's a when there's no ambulances in the county. And John, my method is proprietary, so no. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm happy to share with you after some of the details. But uh, we really focused on removing the barriers. Uh, one of those barriers has been for quite some time the national testing <laughs> network and having candidates pay money to take a test. And we've just found that the, the more you can afford to take it, the better you can get your score before you submit it. So uh, a, a computer program was picking the cream of the crop, so to speak. And we, we don't get to see a lot of people. So we'd like to see more people and decide for ourselves. So, but I can give you some more details. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if we have informational items. Anybody have anything you want to share with the board? Other than, as I mentioned, I'm going to get a new meet January 5th. So, uh, next uh, you're going to run a verified by Zoom. Yeah, no. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, the five minutes on the treadmill had my blood pressure at 230 over 105. My knees hurt so bad. <laughs> Except I had to get it so I could get it be okay. So, stubborn sweet is a good thing. Uh, uh, the only thing I would add would be FDA annual conference coming up. February 8th, 10th, 12th. If any of the directors are interested in attending, please work with uh, me or Ariel. Oh, 
Yeah. Show them off. So we we try to turn the show. Be off too. Uh, work with me. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. <laughs> they probably already got me signed up at Sunrise, but at some point I should figure that out. Okay, the next board of directors meeting will be on Monday, January 22nd at 5 p.m. The meeting will be hybrid with the public invited to attend either by remote video conference or in person at station five. Uh, and we're not going to read the address. We're right here. Uh, so the regular board of directors meeting of the Clackamas Fire District Board is adjourned at 6.34. Merry Christmas to all. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Happy holidays. You're feeling better. Thank you. Thank you.